the course of the last few weeks, we've met a lot of Gerim, Jewish con converts to Judaism. And I love meeting converts because I like their story. Uh, there's uh, the, the Abraham paradigm. Abraham is the father of all converts, right? So he has to go on an adventure, Lech Lecha, Mi'art and his tests keep moving on up, like difficulty. First, okay, you have your wife and, and your nephew, and you have your followers, so it's not, it's still a little bit of a challenge to just go, you know, follow, follow, your, follow your divine inspiration and go where God tells you where you don't know where you're going and trust him. And then the, the level of uh, test moves up until he actually has to do the most horrific of tests, sacrifice your own child or potentially do such a thing. Okay, so that's, that's the test, the experience that most uh, gayrim, I guess, have to go through. They have to leave their family. They have to leave their, what they're familiar with. They leave their place and they go to the place that God shows them and they become part of a great nation. So that's a challenge. People like me who come from, let's say, a very Jewish background, so we have more of a Yitzchak test. Yitzchak's born into it. So some people have the Yitzchak experience. Some people have the Avram Avinu experience. I do not envy the convert because that's, that's foolish to envy people because they have a different life. It doesn't matter, you know. It's just foolish. But I certainly admire them. My Rosh Hashiva said uh, in response to uh, feminism, Western-style feminism, which is completely foreign to him, said men and women cannot be equal. They're they are inherently different from each other. You know? And I said, he, no, sorry, he said, I was quoting him, he said, I would want to one day perhaps give birth. What's it like to bear a child? I could never know that thing. I'm a man. God didn't give me that experience. But I certainly admire you know, the women who bring many children into this world, every woman who goes through childbirth. That's an experience. That's an experience that none of us will ever have. So we can admire people and say like, wow, that's, that's really something. So uh, I, I get the same thing when I see people like my wife and uh, her friends, inspiring women, and also uh, these converts, I see people who have totally different lives than the one that I was given, dealt a totally different hand in life, and I admire what they do with it. And I just say, like, I can't experience what they have experienced, and I can't, certainly I can't judge them, but I, I admire what they have done. And uh, yeah, so for all your converts out there, uh, good job. And uh, thanks for associating with us because uh, uh, it's an honor. Okay, uh, Shmuel, remember I told you about the Kotel on, uh, on uh, what was it, Monday? Right, like the place where people can experience what they're used to, like this at a more grand site, whereas uh, at the temple, they can't. What was I referring to? So, you know, you have your Talson to fill in, right? So, you go to Shul, you know how to do Shul. Shul is where you go and be Jewish. You walk in, you put on your talis and tefillin, you know the prayer book. It doesn't, even if you pick up some Sephardi prayer book with which you're not familiar, it's mostly familiar, you know? You know what you're doing in shul. Going to the Kotel is great. Why? Because it's just another shul, technically speaking. So you know how to put on your talis and your tefillin, and you could cry, and you could daven, and everybody who has his synagogue experience has it, you know, especially if you're a newbie and you're not familiar with the fact that you could actually go to the temple nowadays and that's the right way place to pray. And this is just like the parking lot thereof. So when you go to the Kotel, and I remember this, I was also a 19 year old. It's a lot more tense. You suddenly pray with a lot more fervor because this is the, this is the great synagogue, right? If it's Kabbalah Shabbat, so it's a lot more Labor Day. If it's a holiday, it's a lot more intense. On Tisha B'Av, it's certainly the most appropriate place you could pray on Tisha B'Av. We were there on Tisha B'Av. It is the Hurban, alive and well there. So the Kotel is Judaism, as we know it, just to the max. Whereas, unfortunately, uh, you go to Harabayas, and you're not allowed to wear your talis, you're not allowed to fill in, you're not allowed to shuckle, right? Even if you shuckle, they say you're mishtateach. I saw two people accused on Monday. One guy was sort of on his knees, and another guy was shuckling a little bit. They're both accused of doing the whole thing. Yeah, oh, oh, it was you? Okay, fine. Was one of them. Some, some guy in a hat, you know, some guy looked very Jewish being, being harassed for acting Jewish. And of course, you can't pray out loud. Oh, you pray too much out loud. There's Jews davening Shmon Esri, and there's a cop there who's like, no, don't get too excited about your prayer. Don't be too loud. Jeez, crying out loud. It's just a lot, it's a lot of people, 20 men davening together, even if they're not raising their voices. It, it, it sounds like saying, oh, don't, don't be, don't pray too much. That's unfortunate. And that's why many of us cannot cope yet with going to the temple, because you can't do your Judaism there. 
And that's a, that's a crying shame. And, and on the other hand, God willing, when things improve there, sorry, by tomorrow we shouldn't think it should improve. Even if you could wear your towels and your tefillin and finally do what you wanted to do, it's not like at the Kotel. You have the text of the prayers are different. If you're Kohen, the way the blessing is said is different. You get to bow down on the stones. There's a lot that is supposed to be different. Either way, Jews have to learn these things. They have to know, they have to familiarize themselves. The Judaism of the future is not the Judaism which with, with which they are familiar today. That should be obvious for anybody who studies these things. But there's, it happens very in, infrequently. Uh, that we just don't, don't think about it. Okay. I also have to remind people, because uh, my wife said so, this is Haggadah to Pesach. Many of you already have a copy. Thank you. For those who bought a copy, uh, I appreciate your support. Remember, this is a non-for-profit endeavor. This is just to cover our costs so we could publish more books and uh, cover, pay for what we already printed. This comes in Hebrew and English. If you are Jewish and you believe in the Torah, then you need a copy of this. Why do you need a copy of this? Because God willing, when we have Passover this year, this is the Seder that you have when the Korban Pesach is on the table. If Chas V'Shalom, you're in a situation, for whatever reason, you're doing a Seder without Korban Pesach this coming year, so you'll take out your old Maxwell House or Art Scroll Haggadah and use that. But for the Jews who are going to be doing it right in Jerusalem, you need this copy. As a matter of fact, even uh, Dr. Makbili, who was kind enough to donate these svarim to our endeavor, as we learn these, and we'll get the, you guys will eventually be able to go home with these. That's from Dr. Makbili. He tried to put together a Haggadah, which you could technically use also at the Seder of Korban Pesach, but he did not do it the way we did it. He basically made it, if you have Korban Pesach, do this, and if you have uh, no Korban Pesach, do this, like a split down the middle at certain pages. But it's a little bit inconsistent because he doesn't tell you if you have Korban Pesach, then you have to leave certain things out beforehand. And there are things that you have to add. So you might be stuck. It's like a choose your own adventure book. You'll be flipping through pages and a little bit confused. This one only has the service that you need when you actually have Corbin Pesach. So uh, I am currently the exclusive distributor of these. If you want to get a copy, uh, send me uh, an email, WhatsApp, uh, call me. And uh, shipping is just a few shekels. And uh, there's discount prices for Kolo guys, Yeshiva uh, buffers, etc. And the English edition is almost sold out. And hopefully, if we sell our first run, we'll be able to go to a second printing. So uh, please spread the word and uh, don't forget about that. So one, more, one thing we're hoping is, and uh, this is why we study these issues. I used to think that there was a political so solution to our problems here. Well, what are the main issues as I see them affecting the Jewish state, the socioeconomic situation? which is kind of weird. We still have socialism and, you know, uh, the taxing system is kind of weird. Like we said about Arnona, you can't convince, you can't get people to think outside the box, especially the people make the decisions. And then there's the problem that we don't build new settlements and new neighborhoods. We have to expand the housing market greatly here in Israel and also in the so-called West Bank. And it's just not happening. There's too much bureaucratic red tape and just those who want to see it not happen. And thirdly, there's the issue of the Beit HaMikdash. And the Jewish people have to wake up and realize that it's their duty to build such a thing. And we've been talking about that. And I used to think it was a political situation. I used to think that perhaps if everybody would just vote for the right political party or the right person, and he would implement those policies, it was going to happen. But that's a pipe dream today. We've had how many elections in the last five years? I lost count. Now, you guys are probably, did you guys get to vote in the first elections? You're, you're youngsters. Have you voted yet? No, you voted? I'm not no, a you're not a citizen. Okay, so it used to be I voted, you know, I voted because I became a citizen here. And at least the American way I vote, you know, vote for president. It's been every four years, so I can tell you how many times I voted. You know, I voted back in 2000, so that I wrote a certain regularity. Here in Israel, it's, a, it's a freakishly frequent. And things haven't really helped. You know that, why can't a government that's stable form? Because we know how people will vote. People vote for the parties they vote for. And we certainly don't have even, even representation in the Knesset for the things we want, which means we have to work on the educational aspect. We have to grow the next generation. And how do you do that? By teaching. I sincerely believe that if everybody were to study this and want to put into practice, and we continue with this, you, go, you guys go home, teach it to your friends, 
have some children, teach it to your children also, get them involved. Uh, like Rabbi Barachim says, it's going to take a generation. He really told me this. He said, now, maybe you're, you're thinking about too fast. It's going to take a generation before we could change the way people think. It's like the Zionist movements. How did they get all those people to move to Israel? Well, you have to have a youth movement. You have to work on the youth. And thank God, like I told you, that major change that happened over the last decade when we went up to Harabayas and Tisha B'Av, let's say 10 years ago, 11 years ago. So it was just a few individuals and I had to sneak on with a bunch of Gentiles. Remember? That was, that was pretty bad. But people heard about these exploits. And then last year comes to Shabbat and there's a, you know, throngs trying to get on there. And the youngsters know who I am. So they grew up. And that's a good thing. And we're trying to educate people more, teach your neighbors, teach whoever will listen to you. Hello. Let's, let us go and let us arise. Let us ascend. We have to learn these things. So uh, let's open it up. I'm going to put this on the screen. I forgot to put it on the screen. Where were we last week? Chapter 8, my goal is to get into one of the more interesting things for people who uh, study the esoteric aspects or just the, the technical aspects. Uh, we're going to get to the, the making of the Ketoreth soon. What do you use to make Ketoreth? Spices. Yeah, spices. You know, ever, you ever smoke incense or do it? Well, yeah, well, whatever. But there's, you know, the, how, how much consensus there is about identifying all those things? Yeah, basically. We're going to see that soon. And then it was just on Shabbos, I realized the sages say there's 11 uh, spices, right? And then you count on your list. Open up your sitter. How many are on that list of 11? Well, not, yeah, okay. Obviously, you're, you're getting to the punchline. Let me put this on the screen. Think about it. Or you could look in your sitter and start counting and then say, hey. And then more. Four, four, three, and then more. Yeah. Four plus four plus three is 11. And then some, <laughs> okay. So what's going on there? Well, we're not including like the the lye and the liquids. Boris Karshina, okay, but even that, there's Melach Sodomit. Boris yeah. Karshina is not technically an ingredient. Well, that's not a spice, it's a salt, but it's a compound. So, wait a minute, the spices have to come from vegetable sources only? They can't be organic? They can't be inorganic? The spice parts, but the problem is the Rambam says some of them have animal components. It's not just vegetable, it's mineral and animal. Yeah, very, very supremely interesting. And what each part is supposed to do. So, it's for, it does something. Yeah, yeah. What part is animal? Yeah, we're going to see the more. According to the Rambam, the more is. Okay. Uh, Malay is, is a is a, is a herb. I want to put. Yeah, myrrh is okay. One, everybody usually translates more as myrrh, except the Rambam calls it musk, musk from deers. So, yeah, we're going to see this inside. Uh, basically, the punchline I want to get to is it's 11 plus Kipat Haryardain, Male Ashan, and Melach Sedomit. And there's Boris Karshino, which is used for first scrubbing the, the what is it, the, the Shelet or whatever it is. So, there, there's a lot more in there, but they put in it's because. These other three things, the little bit of salt and the male ashan, whatever it is, smoke razor, and uh, this uh, kipara gardein, those are just trace amounts. Those are additives, basically. So they're not there for the smell. They're there for some chemical purpose. But they're not, you know, like, you know, take a few a mishkal, a few shkalim worth of these things and grind them up. Whatever, they're, they're a critical part. So those are insignificant. But you just remember, you go through the count, you say it's 11, and so you get the 14. And you realize that something's not going on right. But that's not what we're doing today. Today we're in uh, the eighth parak. We're talking about Shmirat HaMikdash, which is guarding the temple. Shmirat HaMikdash, it's about to say, V'afal pi she'en sham pachad me'oye v'lo milistim. See? The Shmirat HaMikdash. It's there, even if there's no fear for the, the enemies or robbers, whoever it is. She'en shmir tho ela kavod lo. It's an honor guard. Like those, uh, like those uh, guys in the costumes outside of the you know, the palaces and, and they have in London, right? Yeah. Or at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. What do they have? Have you guys seen that? The changing of the guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? Yeah. We've never been there. And they made us go there in Arlington National Cemetery. So there's a, a sometimes one soldier, I think it's like two or whatever. They have to march back and forth a certain way holding their rifles. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain time of the day, a new guy comes and he's like, the, he barks some orders and they officially switch the guards, you know? And they have a whole thing. It's like a constant thing. An honor guard, a tomb of the unknown soldier. So too, this is an act of honor to the temple. 
Eno dome palterin sheis allow shomerin, le falterin sheen allow shomerin. You can't compare uh, a palace which has guards, an honor guard, to one which does not. Uh, you look on the notes here, Rambam added in more Nevuchim that uh, it's also, uh, technically speaking, you have the guards there to keep away the Tameim. That's part of the job as a Levi. Think about it. What are the Levi's job in the temple? The Levi's are on guard at night, and they act as gatekeepers and singers. You don't need that many singers. So how many guys do you have to open up the gates? You know, you open up the doors in the morning and close them at night. How many Levim do you need to do this? So, well, yeah, two, two Levi's at each gate, one for each door. So, no, the gatekeepers mean they're there to actually keep people away and act as guards. So that's why I said I, I'd rather that the, the, the Temple Mount be turned over to the tribe of Levi. You know, and the uh, two corporations, we know the group of Levi's and the subgroup that's even more in charge, the Kohanim, they're the ones who are supposed to be in charge. And uh, he also brought, thank you for the, the editors here, who said that uh, it's supposed to keep out, he says, uh, what is it? it says, Kosov Likute uh, I think, that the Shmir is there in order to keep strangers out, Zarim. Who's a czar with regards to Kahuna? A czar is anybody who's what? Exactly. Czar is anybody who's not a Kohen. So you don't want you want to keep the Kohanim, you want to keep the non-Kohanim out. There's someone who said that it's there. Uh, they don't know a reason. That's the Mafari said that. And then you have the Rush who says that people shouldn't have Hesech Hadath. Hesech Hadath means people take their mind off of it. They're supposed to be just a community. The community is always supposed to have its mind in the Mikdash. So even though the Mikdash is closed at night, what do they do? They have to have people in charge at the Mikdash all night long. Good. Uh, the second halacha, Ushmirazo mitzvata kol alayla. This commandment to guard the, the temple is all night. Mashomirim, heina luim la koanim. Who are the guards? Levites and the priests. Shnemar, you have koanim and levim. And Mahon Mamre has Mashomirim heima koanim vaha levim. Wow, okay. Another Shinui Girsa we have. Makbili. Versus Korean, but usually Makbili agrees with Mahon Mamre. Although Mahon Mamre, by the way, added a, a lot of extra yuds and stuff. They, everything everything they spell is Ketiv Malay, even places where I wouldn't. And uh, did you guys notice the Mahon Mamre with uh, Nikud is non Tiberian Nikud? You notice that? Okay, it doesn't fit the normal biblical Nikud. It has like a, a different Nikud that you're not going to have in Makbili or in the Korean. It's uh, whoever that fellow who passed away a few months ago, Reb Arfim's friend. So he'll have the word like Mose, which means a person who found something, Mem Bav Tzadi Aleph. Normally we have a, the, the, the Nikud under a Tzadi and those uh, participles that end with a, with a silent Aleph is a Tzere. If there's a He, it's a Segol. If it's an Aleph, it's a Tzere like if it was any other consonant. But they vowelize it with a Segol as though it's a silent He. It's kind of weird because then you don't have a difference between Kore and Kore. When it's a silent He, like what's happening? Ma Kore, it's a Segol. And you, you're Ashkenazic, so you know when you read something, it's with the Tzere, so you read it Kore. But, you know, in modern Hebrew, they pronounce it the same way, Spartan pronounce it the same way. And here they would vowelize it, even though it's with an Aleph, they'd spell it also with a Segol, for example. That's one of the strange Nikud things that they have. Okay. Uh, just, I'm even Yavin, and if you want to look into it, you can. So basically, it's the quantum with him. They, they don't disagree with the Halacha here. Shnemar atau vanecha itcha itach lefnei olmoed. This was told to Aaron. So you can understand why Kohanim go first. God told Aharon that you and your children are going to guard, stand guard in front of Olam Oed, and uh, it's talking to Aharon, so the Kohanim go first. Glomar, attempt you, Shomrim lo. Varish ne'mar v'shomrut mishmer to Oed. And then said the Levim also join in, and they also guard the charge of the Olam Oed. V'ne'mar v'achonim l'fnei ha'mishkan kedma l'fnei Olam Oed, mizracha Moshev Aharon v'anav shomrim mishmer to Mikdash. At the eastern gate of the sanctuary courtyard that's where aaron and moses were staying and aaron and his sons were kohanim and moses and his sons were Levim. so you see that they practiced this commandment even while they're still in the desert if they did not uh, keep this guard so they're just uh, they're they're nullifying the positive commandment by the way this mitzvah seems to apply even when the temple is in ruins why? Because even when the temple's in ruins, you're supposed to, you know, respect the temple. So this thing we're supposed to do right now. We're supposed to have rebuild the temple. And while it's being rebuilt, we should already institute this commandment. This is something that's easy to perform. 
means they stand around and they stay awake and they have the guy with the torches and everything and they you know they get uh, they have checkups and all that just like uh, the police have guards by the way by guard i mean like shifts uh well i think i wasn't clear about something last week i mentioned that the tabernacle in shiloh was wide open uh, not a defined as a raw by that i meant that uh they could eat koche kalim let's say the sacrificial foods that regular israelites could eat anywhere behold haroah but they technically still had the Klaim, the defined mechitza that surrounded the Azara back then. That was still there so they could know where to eat the kudshe kudshin. What it what exactly looked like, we don't really know. It was the same curtains that they had in the actual tabernacle in the desert and that they re-put in Nov, or was it something else, some other you know, symbolic mechitza? We don't know. I guess you could go check it out because you go to the site of uh, the Mishkan where it used to be in Shkilo, it doesn't seem to be that they actually put a wall there. And you, know, you can see where it was. There's no remnants of a wall that used to be standing around the Azara. So it seems that it might have been just been the same curtains. Okay. Uh, maybe one day we'll find out the answer to that question. Um, Louis, well, Rashi mentions, talks about in this week's uh, uh, annual part uh, of uh, the, the distinction of like when the Muslim kept moving around. Yeah. And the way to move it. Lotasun Kane. Yeah. yeah. This is, by the way, for those keeping the annual cycle, this is a great power shot. It's the first time we have that term, the Makomashri of Har Hashem. And it basically talks about the role of the temple in the grand scheme of things. We're going to speak about this in Katsrina. I don't want to, I already have, took my notes of all the things we, that need to be said about the parasha. Uh, we'll just say one thing. It seems that the Pasuk, Lotasun Kane, you guys studied Rashi yet on the parasha? Well, you no, know, you read Uncle Liz, okay, but you should also read Rashi every now and then. Rashi is uh, quite good. There's a reason why he's so popular. You guys need drinks, by the way? There's still cups in the closet. Okay, everybody brought. Good. Lotasun Kain, La Shem Elokechem. We have a trailer for what we're going to say in uh, Leil Shabbat. It, Rashi brings two shots. Lotasun Kain means don't do like the Canaanites, that they had places of worship, sacrificial worship all over the place, right? They did every nice tree, every nice hill. You can't do that. And they says, lo tasun kain could mean don't do this whole erasure thing. The commandment is to destroy all the Canaanite places of worship, destroy all their idols, burn down their Asherot, every place where they bow down, etc. There's all the whole thing, nitatz temet right? So you shouldn't do that to God. What does that mean? You shouldn't do anything destructive to the temple or the altar. And you shouldn't erase God's holy name. Because it says, Make their name go lost from that place. So you shouldn't do that to God's name. Let's say you work with that pasuk. Because that's not that's less pshat, but that's a drash. But the chazal actually say that's a halakha. There's a prohibition. Rambam counts it among the big 613. To harm the mizbeach or the temple or to erase God's name. And there's actually how many of God's names counted for this prohibition? There's a list. Yeah, the seven names that you can't erase. Well, uh, there might be, but I'm just quoting the, the Rashi and the Sifre, as quoted by the Halacha. Okay, the point is that that's not necessarily the shot in Pasuk, but that's what Chazal Paskin. So you're not allowed to do this. And then you look in the next pasuk. Let's run with this. Lo tasun kein la shem lekechem. What's the next pasuk? Ki im al makom asher yivchar shem lekechem v'chol shivdechem l'asumet shemosham l'shechno tid rishu vacha shama. So we have a lot of uh, basically everybody went to Harabai this week. Every rav who spoke said l'shechno tid rishu vacha shama. It's a commandment to seek out the temple. Go to the temple. And they read the Ramban there, which is wonderful. See what the Ramban says. We saw it on Shabbos. Who was here on Shabbos? What you guys was here on Shabbos? No, it was someone else. Robert, was, Okay, Robert. Someone else was also here, so we're learning with him. He was supposed to be here, wasn't he? Is he coming? No, he, he's, 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 he left, though. His flight's on Thursday, isn't it? Whatever it is. We'll have some pizza in his honor. Anyways, so uh, uh, what does he say? That lo tasun kain means go to the place God chose, correct? And Rashi had just told us, la lacha. We hold that it means don't harm the temple. You know, to break anything off the temple or harm the Mizbeach and erase God's name. And Lotas Sun Kane, and then says, Ki Mel Makom means, here's what you should do, not to bring it about. The implication is that 
if you do not go visit the site of the temple, if you do not up, uh, keep this commandment, like Rashi says, you are causing the opposite to happen. You're causing the destruction of the temple and the altar and the erasure of God's name. That is, if you want to prevent this Chil Hashem of the destruction of the temple and, and the altar, then you specifically, actively have to go visit the temple. And that's a good Moser Haskell for everybody. And that seems to be what Rashi's getting at, because that's what the Pasuk says. So people have forgotten this. If you, you know, it's one thing, you, everybody has an obligation to go to the temple today, because as long as Jews are treating, let's say, other places of worship as the highest you can get to, and they're ignoring the temple, then we're causing the destruction of the temple. And uh, you can look at it. That's uh, I think it's quite clear that's what the Pasuk means. Okay. Uh, next he says, Ushmartem uh, Ushmar Kodesh. He says you should keep this guard. And don't forget, there's, uh, like they say, a few places, this root, Shin Mem Reish, Shin Mem, shin mem Reish, is always a uh, prohibition. Azhara means uh, thou shalt not. Okay. Aside from the fact they have to guard it, it means that this is one of the big... Uh, 365 no nos. Don't do this. Wait, well, okay, but it's yeah, it's not a chi of kares, but it's an isr lotase. Yeah. Not every most isr lotase is not the chi of kare, right? Yeah. It's malkut or something that doesn't have a punishment. Next, mitzvah shmiratosh you akonim. Shomerim bi mifnim valavim bi bachutz. Is that unanimous? So there's a note here that says not necessarily. Some say the kwanim are upstairs and the levim are downstairs. Okay. So on the places that have gagot, gagot and aliot, and the levim are on the the floor, basically, you know, whatever surface level. Barba'is ve'asrim eda shomerin oto b'chol laila tamid. Barba'a ve'asrim makom. Twenty-four groups. Stationed at 24 places around the temple. Some say no, 24 men at 24 places around the temple. And how does it break down? The Kwanim take three places of these 24, and Levim have the other 21. And some divide it up differently. You see that there's a thing over here. They say no, it's, uh, he says here, All twenty-four for Levim. And there are three of those places where they're also Kwanim. And some divided up differently. Like he says, the Tosvos here says that there are Srim Ve'achad Mekomot, Vishlosham Mekomot, Ayushomim Kwanim Ulavim, Vot Shmonav Esrei Mekomot, Ayushomim Ulavim Levad. What does that mean uh, in English? There's uh, three places there are Kwanim Ulavim, and another 18 there were just Levim. That's how they break it down. Okay. Yeah. It says that there, Levad. Okay, that's the Piske Tosfos. That's Rimbe Echad Mikol. Yeah, Saka Kol. Yeah, it's just 21. Uh, which is Tals Tosfos? I don't know. Uh, we'll see it. Uh, it said the Piske Tosfos at the beginning of the Midos. Uh, yeah, thank you. Another credit to the Korean. Makbili doesn't bring you these other Shitas, by the way. He just focuses on the Rambam. That's why it's good to have this. There's some other ones uh, regarding this because uh, I just spoke to one of the Rabbanim today who's pointing out. We like to study Rambam and these things because he put it all together. But sometimes maybe the Allah isn't like the Rambam. Rambam didn't have a living tradition necessarily for all these things. He read the Gemaras and he tried to put it together. And even corrected, he says, in the past they had faulty girsas of the Gemara and really it seems that the Allah should be a different way. Okay, but for many, many, many cases, it's a reconstruction. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of living, uh, uh, we don't have a living tradition of how it is. It's like, um, well, it was in 2009, they did Birkat HaChama. As you know, Rav Kapach and his parish said, this whole Birkat HaChama thing is really fishy. There's something really wrong about it. It doesn't fit anything else we have in Shas. And after he passed away, Rabbi Archim found out it's because it's not from Shas, it's from the sectarians. It's basically a Tzaduki thing, right? You know what I'm talking about? You seen this yet? Birkat HaChama was last performed on, the, on in 2009, according to the 28-year cycle. Oh, I did it once. You did, I, I, did, I did it in, in June, okay? Because that's the older opinion. It's, yeah. it, it's, you know, it's even in the Encyclopedia Tabutica, and Rabbi Yosef says, yeah, you look in the oldest Kisveyad and the oldest Gionim who talk about this. It's the bracha on the summer solstice. And then suddenly you find in Rashi's time, the Gemara suddenly say it's every 28 years. That's where the Rambam had it also. 
but this whole 28 theorem doesn't work out. And then you go study the history of the, the, the sectarian groups that existed in the later Second Temple times, including the Sadducees, and you read their books, and they dug up a lot of the, these things in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You've, been, you've seen the Dead Sea Scrolls? I was at the Shrine of the Book this week. Yeah, I was there on yeah. Sunday. You're there. Okay, so you're there this week. You read about what these people had. They had the 28-year cycle. It's mentioned in the book of Enoch. Hanoch, that's a, it's a, you know, one of the farm right. kids on him. So they're the ones who came up with this. So, you know, you see that perhaps, you know, not everything is like the Rambam. And we're going to see soon there's halachas also. Generally speaking, a lot of halachas of the Nida, especially that whole thing that women have to start their counts right when they, you know, the first time. And they have to keep track of these numbers since they're like teenagers. In practice, no one's done that. No one does do that, and that's a that's a little bit of an issue. Maybe the halachas like the Rambam, but most people don't keep like the Rambam in this regard at all. Okay, so just to know, maybe there things will change. We'll see other cases we saw up until now, like 20 different places already, where major machlokas, it might not be the Rambam's correct, or that even the Sanhedrin would decide, let's follow the Rambam in this respect. Okay, sorry about not keeping this up over here. So where do they, where do they stand guard? Anybody know? Well, look at a map. We saw the map earlier, so we could put a, you go backwards. I'm going to read these places. is, by the way, their dormitory. That's where the fire was going. That's where most of them are sleeping, but there's also people who have to stay awake. Those are upstairs, basically. They're built at the edge of the Azara. Vavro Ruvin, Hayu Shomrim Sham. And younger Kwanim who have what's a Rove nowadays? A rifle. a rifle. That's the name, but in the olden days they didn't have rifles. But what's the only thing they could shoot back then? Bow and arrow. And a Rove is the guy who shoots. By he Rove Kashoth. It says about Ishmael that he was an archer. So it means archers. Guys who shoot bows and arrows were up there. Basically, these places are high up. It's like a watchtower. And they could basically shoot trespassers. Okay, but one hour could still do quite damage. It's not the same as having a nice shotgun or a rifle, but it does Yeah, you don't want to get an arrow, you know? We've all seen the movies. Uh Bainam Okay Ba'aretz. Bainam Okay is actually, you know, ground level. Vizikne Bait of Shalotoyom Hayu Yushanim Sham Umaf Tichotazara Biadom. The they the elders of the house that was on duty that week, they would actually sleep there and they'd keep the, the keys in their hands. Biyadam doesn't mean literally they were sleeping with the keys in their hands. Biyadam means it was their responsibility. Um, can we cover the pizza and point the fan this way? Like move it like a drop? Let's move the fan, train the fan on me and turn it on onto the lowest setting. Yeah, thanks. Is it plugged in? Yeah, just press the one button. Excellent, thank you very much. Ooh. You know, every week more light bulbs go out. Now we're missing this light bulb. That one's dying. That one died already. Now the fourth one is. You, ever no, you guys notice this? Yeah. They're flashing out now. Okay. The other, the other week I was sitting back there and yeah. I got such a massive headache. From the flashing. The and my, my phone's reflecting onto me. Okay. We have to do something about this. This month starts on Sunday. You guys excited? Basically, all yes, oh, yeshivas? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Getting very excited, getting pumped, and we're still learning. You know, because we'll be doing uh, well, Brachot uh, the Q. So, and actually, has, uh, yeah, on, on the Rishalmi, he has a whole series there. You could see, I have this in my, my uh, records online. There's It's uh, time-stamped. Back in 2016, when I was finishing it, I said, it seems that you're supposed to say bracha on seeing the full moon. You know, you guys know there's a full moon bracha. It's mentioned, I think that's shot in the Rishalmi. Yeah. I wrote it down. I have it in my notes, in my notes, my notes. I didn't see it anywhere and I, I don't want I didn't want to get in trouble I was afraid and then a few years later Abraham got around to telling people yeah there's a bracha to be said on the full moon it's it's a first Yerushalmi so you, you've seen that they put it in the in the, in the whatsapp group it's a Osev Rishit or uh, the, the Bavli version is Osev Masev Rishit right so there you go I was happy to learn it's a very good thing to learn Yerushalmi brachos and all the thing about when is sundown etc it's a, uh, it's fundamentals. And by the way, it's basically how to grow on the Vilna Gon hold, the Vilna Gon and the Rambam hold. You can't understand the whole sugyas unless you actually study Yerushalmi there. So go ahead, learn your brachos Yerushalmi, and you should finish the whole Yerushalmi. But obviously, Chazal felt that the first thing you should learn is brachos Yerushalmi, right? Before you learn Sanhedrin Yerushalmi, you should learn brachos, right? It's first. 
Okay. Uh, let's continue here. Lo ayu kohano kohanim ashomrim yeshenim bevigdei kuna. They cannot sleep in big day kuno, though they can wear them all day. Once the day of, uh, is over, they're going to sleep. They can't sleep in big day kuno. Why not? Because it's shotness. Big day kuno have shotness. Where is the shotness located? Not in the turban. Well, yeah, the avnate, the sash, the belt thing. It was multicolored. It had three components of wool and one component of linen. Ella mikapolito tan umanichinotan keneged rashihem. They fold them up and put them next to their heads. They don't even use them as pillows because that's using shotness. You can't make a shotness pillow or a shotness pillowcase. Viloshim big deatsman, vishinim alarts. They wear their own clothes. They sleep directly on the ground. I mean, it's not ground, it's it's stone floor. I mean, they have to sleep on the stone floor. No, they could put something, it means they didn't have beds, but they could sleep on a mat of some sort, you know, something soft. That's not that's not excluded. It just means they didn't have regular beds. Why? The tradition was that those who guard the court, the king's courtyards outside their houses, so they have to sleep on the ground. But it doesn't mean literally on the ground or literally on stone. It just means not in beds. Okay? Oh, you could sleep on a mattress. A bed means it has legs. Well, it means the whole frame. It means a, a proper bed. They didn't sleep on proper beds. It's like in the army or whatever. You do, do camp out, you know, put, put something soft on the ground or put your sleeping bag or something like that. But it doesn't mean they had to sleep directly on the ground. The point is they don't sleep in a bed so that they understand that they're on duty and they could get up fast. I don't know. When I was, uh, when I was your age, I used to have to sleep on uh, gym mats and sleeping bags and stuff. Went away all sorts of places. No, you guys don't do that anymore. Now I'm a little bit... Okay, now I'm a little bit more of a, an istinist since, uh, since I got older. I remember it was a thing you had to do for Shabbos. I remember we went to the Karl Shav of blessed memory. It's Karl Bachel Shav. They rebuilt it. It burned down a few years ago. Yeah. Have you guys been there? So you missed the experience. It's only 20 minutes away from the Midgar. Okay. So when, when, I was, when I was your age, remember I went there when I was 19. It's like, you know, guys just go there for Shabbos. And it's very like free for all. It's like you stay at some family's house. It's like four strangers on the floor on a gym mat. And you don't, you don't have anything to sleep. It's like I slept in my trench coat. Okay, so that's the way they used to do it, you know. When you're younger, when you're in the army, you could get away with these things, like sleeping in the sukkah. A rock carry le chad mehen. What happens to the ball carry? Ball carry is not even supposed to be on harbais, correct? So he's got to get out there quickly. So hulech bam karka. Technically, under the temple mount is not temple mount. It's not kodesh. Yeah, you're surprised. Okay, so that's where he has to go. Okay, so... Yeah. It says... Uh, Eliyahu's going to come and tell us all the answers, right? Yeah. Right? Oh, well, that, that's, that's, that's what they say. Tish biatari, it's kushi of So Eliyahu's going to come. So you can't surprise Eliyahu with anything. He's not going to be surprised. He's going to know all the answers. But sometimes Eliyahu is surprised. Okay? So uh, the point is here that he says he has to go basically in one of the Mesibah Shatachat Karka. There's a passageway that's underground. Mm-hmm. So he goes through the Beta Mokade. That's where they're, they're, they're basically sleeping. So he just quickly goes underground. And he continues, These passageways that are open to our bias, they're underground, they were not sanctified. They're like the rest of Jerusalem. He immerses. Now he's a tefulion. Uh, and he goes back and he sits among the rest of his friends, the, his brothers, the Kwanim. Now he's a tefulion. So he, he can't serve in the temple. He has to wait for Ari of Shemesh. He has to wait until tomorrow night until he's completely pure. But Tavul Yom is not loud in Harabayas. Ad should put him asherim baboker until they open up the gates in the morning. You'd save a whole echlo, and then he leaves because he can't serve in the temple that day. He's now with Tavul Yom. So that's the guy that ha- had carry happen to him. And um, yeah, so I guess this happened enough. This is another reason why I argued. Remember that they say, the Rambam said earlier that the Ark of the Covenant was hidden in these passageways somewhere under the Harabayas, which means that the Ark of the Covenant is still in a place according to the Ram, the place that's not sanctified as part of the temple even. Remember, those who were trying to select the Meshach Chachma and Rabbi Salvechik and others, that the Rambam says, uh, Paskins, that the, the Aron is hidden under the temple mount because the Aron has to stay in the temple in order for the temple to maintain its sanctity. That was their claim. And I told them, no, that's not what the Rambam is saying. The Rambam is trying to tell you the makom of the importance of the exact place of the Evan Hashashiyah, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. But even if the Ark of the Covenant is not there, it still has its sanctity. And this is one of the proofs to that contention, because according to the way the Ram is saying here now, the Ark is actually in a place that is not technically temple. I, 
don't yeah. how that claim could be made that it's that the auto against like that's it gives it strength and whatever. Like that one doesn't have any uh, purpose. It yeah, I know. There. I know that was another part of the shear. The Arun is just saying that's that's stored there, but people have this. In, in, if you take a mystical approach, the Arun is a concentration. It's an antenna of Kedusha. And it being there is what grants the temple its sanctity. And that's why they have this idea also that when the Ark was not there, which is a Havamina in the Rishami, the temple lacks its sanctity and there's a Heter Bamot. And that's why Nov and Givon, which never had the Ark of the Covenant, were not completely temple. And that's why during those times, they could offer sacrifice anywhere else. That's what they claim. Look, they can make such a claim, but that doesn't fit the sheet of the Rambam. Yeah, it doesn't fit the conclusion of both Talmud. Okay? So you could go this. It's all been put up on YouTube. I also put all the sources in Hebrew and English on certain websites. So you should go look at them. Yeah. That's your mind thing. Yeah. At the, at the very end of that article, yeah. uh, you mentioned that Nov might be from... Uh, the Latin. Nova? No, because Nova. Nova. I know it's not pronounced like a, like a V. Right, it's a, it's a, it's a what? So, I mean, if it would be... That's a bet. I know, but if it yeah. would be brought over into Hebrew, wouldn't it be... So you can't, in, in old Hebrew, uh -huh. here's the funny thing, do, do this exercise. Mm -hmm. One of my proofs to people tell them that a cholam is pronounced with a W sound at the end is that you will never find a cholam and then a consonantal vav in, throughout Tanakh. You could find examples of a patach and then a consonantal vav, like the word kav, line, right? Mm -hmm. You could have a kamatz and a consonantal vav. You could have a chirik and a consonantal vav. You could have a tzerei and a consonantal vav. But you'll never find an u sound, a shiruk and a kibbutz, and then a consonantal vav. You never find the, what people say should be uv or ov. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the vav already is a w sound, so it's just u and o. It doesn't add anything. Just like you will never find a consonantal yud after a chirik. Because a chirik is, is the yud is part of it. There's no such thing as adding a yud sound after a chirik. So in Latin, in Hebrew, if you want to say nov, you have to write it with a vet. But, so and and in Latin, there's, there's no. It's not a vet yeah. in Latin. In, so what? Exactly in Latin, so it's, it should be Noah. In old Latin, like pig Latin, it would be Noah. Okay. Yeah. Class, it would be Noah. In Hebrew, there was no way to write Noah. Okay. There's no way to write it in biblical Hebrew. Nun. Above with the dot on top, let's say, and then a kamatz below it. It would they pronounce Noa. Right? You have a close example, like the name Puwa exists. Mm -hmm. That's or but then in Divrayomim it's pronounced as Pua. You add that. So when you have this, it's like uh when how do you make the demonym of a place a guy from uh Monroe? They wanted a name uh that African colony that the Americans yeah, say for gotcha. they called it Monrovia. Yeah. They added a V, a consonantal V, in order to make the demonym of a word that already ends with a W and a and an O, mm -hmm. and that's that's what you do in 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 English. And when you have something that ends with an O, like a place, Gilo and Shilo, mm -hmm. or a family that ends in O, so you add a Nun, just a Nun, in order to make a demonym, Giloni, Shiloni. Mm -hmm. That is a phantom Nun. So too, if you would encounter this early Latin, it mm -hmm. should be Noa. So in Hebrew. Already, it wasn't it wasn't far off before they start pronouncing a vav like a v. By the way, uh, Doctor Khan says that in even his his form of Tiberian Hebrew, you pronounce a vav very much like a v all the time. Why they picked it up from Latin and Greek? So there were times already that they were already pronouncing sometimes this v sound as a, a, added on to the cholam. It was happening. They they were wanted. They needed to add it. So the 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 people speaking Pig Latin, the vulgar Latin, you know, old European language, are saying Noah. They were saying that, and in Hebrew, they're already you're, adding you're this. Mixing yeah, your Latins. you're mixing your Latin. I don't know the name of the Latin. That's what I'm saying. I said Pig Latin. This, That's a joke. This yeah. would be this would be yeah old Latin, and even still, I'm just thinking about the timeline now. Yeah, I haven't thought about that before. Yeah, it's quite no, late. No, no, quite early. Pigon is is before Java, and Java is usually like yeah, around like 900. Yeah, whatever. it's a very, very old European language. So that's even before Rome is founded. Uh, it Rome depends. Is, Rome is founded in 753 BC. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. It's so, actually founded even later, like 600 BC. So okay, my point is, that's what I'm saying. saying. It's like, it's, proto, it's a proto-Latin language. By the way, so now you brought this up. So now, so now I have to look at proto-Italic. Okay, okay, so gotcha. you, have to, you have to look this up. <laughs> I'm trying to say it doesn't translate exactly, uh -huh. but it, there, there is something lost in transliteration. 
uh, one of the, the person with whom I discussed this online was Professor Eli Tsur. He didn't know me from a hole in the wall. I'm just sending him emails back and forth about this. And it ha of course, he's a, he, he's a, well, his father was a biblical commentator involved, Eli William Dot Mikra. And he, he lectures, he's written a lot of things. And I've had some uh, correspondences with him regarding this very issue. The whole thing with his father, Shita, was mm -hmm. that the Ark of the Covenant has to be on the Temple Mount. So it was because I was writing mm -hmm. a, against what his father wrote that I concerned. I, I sent it to him. I said, I've written this in English and in Hebrew, and I take major issue with contentions that your father made. And he's like, okay, whatever, because he, he put it on Gush's website, his, his father's writings. Mm -hmm. And then two years later, I got back to him again about this whole Novin Givon idea. When we went with Robert to our bias, we went to get our shoes back. Uh, Rabbi Brand was there, Rabbi Yitzchak Brand, the Brisi Yitzchak, who goes to our bias regularly to Davin. You know who he is. Yeah, and he's well, with the long and he wears like a couple of well, he's, he's Hasidic, yes, that's that's Rabbi Brand, Rabbi Brand from Emmanuel. And Professor Litsur also went back to get his shoes. And I started telling the who, the people who were with us, mostly English speakers, this whole idea about the whole Novin Givon, exactly this issue we're talking about. And you're the first one to actually bring up issue with what I said, because it's 29 pages long, and no one ever gets to the end to see this real doozy of a, of, a, of an argument. I know, but look, I saw that you could still go online. I think it had 2,000 reads last time I checked, but no one challenged me on this one issue. Okay. Even though it's it's the most okay, you can cut, shut the fan now. By the way, so th this is the thing that did it. And Professor Eli Tsur, like he's coming back there. Rabbi Brand doesn't speak English, so I was sort of translating for him back and forth, like this and that. And then I said, I'll translate into Yiddish for them. So it was a uh, I'm staying in the middle. Like Rabbi Brand says, tell them this. Okay, the rabbi says this and that. Okay, and then got into this issue, and I started saying this whole chiddush about Nov and, and Nov and Givon and Nov, what its name means. And that's when Professor Eli Tsur shows up, and he starts smiling. And I tell him the punchline, and he gets a really big, like he was grinning at the beginning, and then he just got a big smile on his face, like, ah, oh, where'd you get that? I said, I wrote to you in the email about this. I put it out there. He's like, oh, yeah, like certain light bulb. Like, that's a great, that's a great suggestion. Huh. He really liked the suggestion. So, you know, uh, it, like I said, it's just a suggestion. It could be wrong. But my, I was just, the, the fact is that Professor Leitzer 100% agrees that it seems that Nov was just to the west of where Anatot was, and that the whole idea is, it was, it was the new part of Anatot added to house the temple. And that's why you find that it's an Irkwanim housing the temple. It's like where that, you know, how did Mandachar mm -hmm. There was never Nov until this point. Anatot predates, you know, the, the Israelite conquest and is around in the second temple times as always a Kohanic city and well-known Kohanim were there. Yet at a certain point, it's Nov. And the prominent Kohanic family is there also and they're massacred there. So it's kind of strange. Like why does Evyatar escape from Nov, but when he goes home, he goes back to Anatot. Go back to your field. It must yeah, be. Yeah. It was the same. I think, yeah. I think the whole argument is yeah. really, really strong. So yeah. That, that one thing about the Latin, what yeah. the name of the, but I haven't found a better explanation for it. And by the way, it's also called, it says David went to Nove with a Segol. You notice there, Ooh. right the first time it says it's Nove. And that I thought that's, that's why I thought like, ah, yeah. it must be something going on here. So they say it means it's the directional hay, like Mitzrayimah. But it doesn't really fit grammatically, and it's it's a yeah. segol and not a kamatz, which led me to believe that this is a foreign word being transliterated based on certain things. Don't forget, there's other Latin. Where does where do we find the most Latin and Greek transliterations into Hebrew in the Mishnah and the Gemara? Yeah. And there they have certain rules. Already you have that rule that you can't translate a consonantal cluster. Rule things in Latin that basically the equivalent of stadium and stomach. That's a consonantal cluster of the equivalent of S and T oh, right at the beginning, so right? So. Yeah. So what do you what do you have to do when you have an ST consonantal cluster in Mishnaic Hebrew? Proper Mishnaic Hebrew, you can't have an ST. You can't start a word with sta. Or you know, what do you have to do? You have to, you have to add an aleph. You said istadion or istomicha. So in Hebrew, you have to. It doesn't transliterate perfectly, so you have to you have to Hebraicize it. I also posed out people if you had King George the fifth. In biblical Hebrew, you wouldn't have done that. What would they do? They would first add break apart the consonant, consonant, consonant of the cluster, become Joe Reg. Okay? Uh -huh. They become Joe Reg because break up that consonant of the cluster there. And there's no J sound in Hebrew. The closest consonant to a J sound in biblical Hebrew is a Shin. So, George in Hebrew, just like whatever the non Cyrus is basically Latinized from whatever Koresh was called in Persian, correct? Yeah. So, that's Cyrus. Obviously, you're just reading, it's an anglicized reading of a transliteration, which is the equivalent of a cuff 
a, a yud or a vav, a rish and a, and a, and a shin. Just like dar yawesh is Darius with different, you know, different yeah. vowelization. So Cyrus is there. Koresh obviously is Hebraicized because it, it's a Hebrew form. Yeah. So George would be Shoresh. Okay. Uh, if, if King George V had allowed the rebuilding of the temple, like said, you know, part of the, if, if the Balfour Declaration said all the Jews should come back here, all the Jews should come back and rebuild the temple, like Cyrus himself had said, then, you know, in, in the new prophetic books, we would have called him Shoresh Hamishi. Okay. Shoresh Melech Anglia. Okay, back, back, to, back to the topic at hand, uh, transliterating languages. Well, the Kwanim are on duty, and sort of the Levim, and uh, it says here that the coin could go back into the temple after he's been to mikvah, but it comes back the next day. The five gates of the Temple Mount. You can look at a map to see where these those were exactly. The Al Arba Pinotav Bitocho. By the way, two of those gates, one is still used, the gate that they make the Jews use to go to the Temple Mount with that new wooden bridge, you look at the old models of Jerusalem, it used to be there was a, a stone staircase going up there. And you can see that in the models. And also, I don't know the Hismonian Palace. I just know that it's... Okay, yeah. But it's like right there. You go to, once again, see the shrine of the book right there. They have that model of the temple. So that staircase shown it. You can still see remnants of the staircase that are there. We just go over it in this new boardwalk. Okay? And over that arch where the people are davening under the Kotel, over that was another bridge into the Harabai. So those are two of the gates. But nowadays it's above that area has been, you know, they've added to the wall and there's more structures there, but that used to be one of the main Western gates to the Temple Mount. And there's other ones there. And the Al Arba Pinotav Mitocho, the four inner corners of the Temple Mount. The Al Arba Pinot Hazara Bachutz, at the four edges of the Azara outside of the Azara, Shasur Le Shev Bazara, because forbidden to sit in the in the Azara, which means that these Kwanim could technically sit on these Levim, sorry, they could technically sit while on duty, but they can't fall asleep. At the five gates of the Azara, so they're at the five four sides of the Azara, it's five gates. Technically speaking, you could go, you could pass through the Chael, the rest of Harbais through these structures to get into the Azara also, but the Kwanim are already guarding those entrances. So this adds up to 18 places where they were guarding. The Od Shomrim Belishkata Korban, the room where they kept, you know, extra lambs. Uvlishkata Parochet, that's the place where apparently they were always making new parochot. That was like a thing, you know, it's just the parochet was switched out and washed and there's always a new one. It was a, just like today, what do you do? You donate a parochet to the synagogue. Some synagogues just have one, and then they have one for the Regalim and one for Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, and they don't last. You know, they're, they're right now, today we use velvet, but eventually it needs to be switched out. So that's what they were doing. And after, behind, that's mean the backside of the actual temple edifice. That's the Beit the, the western side. I say, This is, once again, another Chilu figure sows between the 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 Machbili and the Korean uh, the Machbili and the Mechol Manre versus the Korean edition. Okay, so it says to be it seems to be uh, a Dalit and the word Al is there. Uh, another Mimuneh, an appointee who's in charge of all these groups. The Ish Har Habayat Hayanikra. He was called Ish Har Habayas. And the, there's a, there's a fellow who goes to Harabayas regularly. I call, I call him this because he seems to be in charge there. He's the the one who's always there, and it's a good thing that he's there. So this is an honorific title I gave him. And his job is to go around to all the different watches, the different groups, all night long. And he has torches lit in front of him. What does that mean? Sometimes it means that someone else was carrying the torches. It means he doesn't have to carry the torch. He has two torch bearers, apparently. He gets over to that mishmar, that group of Levim. They're sitting there. And they don't stand up and, you know, salute. Salute means as in give him a salutation, saying, Mr. Mr. Harabayas, you know, peace be upon you. Nikar shehu yashen. It means he's sleeping on the job. Chovito b'maklo. And the Ish Harabayas gets to hit him with the stick. Wake up, you know. Rashud ayalo lisrofik suto. He could technically take the avuka and light his clothes on fire. Not a nice thing. Ad shehayu umrim b'yushalayim ma'kol 
in Jerusalem, they would hear suddenly a guy is screaming, and he's getting a beating, he's getting hit on the head, or something, his clothes are on fire. Kol ben Levi loke uvgadav disrafim. Oh, that's the, the the voice of what? Uh, I say no. Okay, nilke with the nun. Okay, sometimes loke means uh means he, he gets hit also. What do I have here? Loke. You have. Okay, I have loke, in both Ma, in 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 mechon mamre and uh, and in Korean it's loke, and he's getting his clothes burned. She lo al mishparo. He was sleeping on his job. And some say you could do this technically to a Kohen also who's caught sleeping. But I mean, a Kohen, Kohanim are technically Levites also. Wait a minute. If Kohanim are a subgroup of Shevet Levi, correct? Aram was technically the Nasi of Shevet Levi. Does that mean if you have an unfortunate case, a man is a Kohen and he has children through a woman who is not eligible to marry into the Kuna? Uh, Grusha, Halala, Zona. So his children are Halalim. Well, Ah, good question. So what's the answer? The answer is no. A halal doesn't even have Levi status. He's completely empty. Uh, we'll see this halacha soon. It comes up. It's in uh, Hilchos uh, Isuri Bia, if I'm not mistaken. So I remember telling people about this. You can say, like, I met an actual person who was telling me, yeah, I'm a halal, back in Queens. So he was, uh, his name was Cohen, you know, like his father's a Kohen. His mother was a Native American convert to Judaism. Okay. So, you know, he's very open. He's like, I happen to be a halal. Okay, it's, it's, it's not a crime to be a halal. It just means that his own son is a halal, and that's that uh, they produce or, more halalim, and his daughter is a halala, which means his daughter should not marry a kohen. Not only does it mean you're disqualified, it also means that your children should not be marrying into the kahuna. So it continues. So, but it doesn't let a person become just a levy. It doesn't say, okay, so now I'll do act like a levy. You know, after all, he is technically a Levite. The answer is, He's not, he doesn't get the privileges of Levia either. He doesn't get to go up to the Torah second instead of first. Okay, we'll see that in its place, God willing. Uh, now it says here, I have Bashachar. In Korean, it's Uva Shachar in the morning. Okay, well, here it says Uva Shachar. Kodem uh, Shiele Abuda Shachar. Before dawn, basically means basically Shachar. Wait, if it's before Abuda Shachar, what makes it Shachar? It means people are getting up already. Samuchlo. Right or right before dawn, whatever it is, you have Oha Mimune Shel Mikdash. You have Mikdash or Shel Mikdash. Oh, you Mimune Hamimune Shel Mikdash. Okay, I just have Shel Mikdash without a hey. The Vid Poke in modern Hebrew say Yid Folk, but they put the dot in the pay. Right, Yid Poke with with a Dagesh. Modern Hebrew is Yid Folk means he knocks. Al Kuanim Shem Beveda Moke knocks on the door. Wake up. Behind Polchinlo and they open for him. Natal Tamaf Teach he takes the key. Ufatach et hashar hakaton or katan. You have katon or katan. Okay, I have katon. Uh, it, apparently, the the mechon mamri is katan. Shebein beit hamoked uvein hazara. Basically, this is the small gate. It's like the service entrance between this the dormitory of the kohanim and the actual hazara. Vinichnas mi beit hamoked lazara. He enters the courtyard from the uh, from the beit moked. Vinichnasu achara vakonim, and they follow him. They have two torches. They go into two groups, some to the right, some to the left. One group goes eastbound because they're entering from the north. That's right. Uh, sorry, that's left. Some make a left to go east. And some go to the right, to the west. So they get to the place where the ones who are preparing this mule offering why is it called a chavitin? Well, it, nowadays, what's a modern Hebrew a chavita is? Scrambled egg in a frying pan, right? An omelet. So it doesn't mean make omelets because eggs were not used in the temple whatsoever. There's no such thing as a sacrifice that involves eggs. It's also not an additive used in any of the meal offerings. Meal offerings are basically made out of flour, olive oil, and some lukewarm water, right? So how does the egg in this and the uh, uh, face up somehow symbolize the Hadiza? Oh, it says you're supposed to... Rambam has two tough shielded, by the way. Right, yeah, if you don't have it, two tough, tough shielded. So the top shield they used was an egg. Because like probably because they just didn't have another yeah. piece of meat. So that's what I'm yeah. Thinking. So yeah, that's the whole thing. It says you're supposed to have a shank bone. Have you ever seen a shank bone? I don't even know what a shank bone is. It's a shank bone is like the foreleg of, of an animal. Most people just use a chicken wing now or a chicken jump stick. Yes, we can use chicken. But it's beef. No, it's beef. So what is it? 
I, okay. I don't know. Well, you can't use roasted sheep uh, if you don't have corn and pesa. Either way, I used to say like uh, the poverty that they had. My father was saying that he used carpas, onions. Onion, you can't even make a brach on it technically. Or potatoes, you know? Well, because an onion, if it's just the type of onion that's harif to eat, it's just a flavoring. It's not like a vegetable you actually eat. But a lot of people do eat onions now. So whatever it is, really carpas is a vegetable that you eat. Okay, carpas means celery in, in Arabic. That's why they use celery. Fine. Uh, but it could be any vegetable. That's not moror, as long as it's a vegetable. So my father says that his father used to use horseradish as moror and onions or potatoes as carpas. Is that the way you're supposed to use it? No, horseradish is technically not moror. Why do they use it? Because in Lita, in Granov, where my grandfather grew up, which is basically just to the east of Lita, it's, uh, uh, it's over, yeah, it's over, Vilna. It's over the, what's now the lithuanian Belarusian border. You, know, you can go see it on a map. So... My grandfather, of blessed memory, you know, really didn't have that good a menu to begin with. It's like they ate maror, and the karpas was potatoes and onions, but that was also the shulchan You know, that, that's basically what they had. You know, and it wasn't it wasn't exactly that they were super wealthy and all that. It's an, and it's and it's basically the pale. What kind of leafy vegetables grow there in in March and April? You know, it's barely spring there. Okay, so it's difficult. And then again, uh, our grandfathers, my grandfathers, didn't really, you know, they ate horseradish as maror, but then again, they didn't really need maror at their seder. You know, they, they lived through maror. My grandfather, my paternal grandfather survived the pogroms uh, that preceded World War I, and my maternal grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. So they didn't really need maror, you know. So it doesn't matter what they had. Uh, next. He says here, they, they went this and they, until he met to this place where they make the chavitin. The point is, they made these meal offerings, they would make them in a frying pan. That's why they're called, that's chavitin. Okay, these uh, shallow frying pan things. Who, what is, who was making the chavitin? The Kohen Godol had to bring this meal offering every day. Similar to a minchat chinuch of a Kohen the first time he serves, except the Kohen Godol has to bring it twice a day. Once in the morning, once in the afternoon. And even if he's not there, so his representative brings this this uh, offering. Higiu elu elu omrim shalom. They meet, they say peace upon each other. Hakol shalom, everything's peaceful. Ve'amidu, uh, no, sorry, ve'amidu. Ve'amidu is uh, past tense. Ha'amidu is a, is a, is an, is a tzivui, it's an imperative verb. It's the one in Pirkei Elvis. Ha'amidu talmidim harbeg, raise up many students. So there it says ha'amidu. It says they let the people osei chavitim lasul chavitim. People in charge of preparing these meal offerings started doing that. This is the order they did every night. Except for the Sabbath when they weren't carrying torches. Why not? On Sabbath, it's muktzah. Wait a minute. I thought they, they could even do on, on the Sabbath. They're even lighting fires in the temple. Oh, very good. Okay. It's at night. Yeah. Okay. So how would they do? How would they see anything? Oh, good. So you read the next words because the next words say, There are candles all over the place that they lit before Shabbos. By the way, that's what proper Jews used to do. Nowadays, we, okay, most of us don't light Shabbos candles. We let the women do that. So we have, it's a formality, right? Shabbos candles, they, they last for how long? Three hours? Four hours? You know, use, use tea lights. What? Depends on what you put in. But how, seriously, how long are the candles burning? I know. One Rav had a miracle, his, his candles burned all night. In the olden days, the mitzvah of candle lighting was, you have to put a 12-hour candle there so that it lasts at least until the morning when you don't need light anymore. If you have Shabbos candles, what's the point of Shabbos candles? Stop tripping over yourself. The lamp was a candle. Okay, so that's what it means. You have to light enough candles, make sure that there's something's burning in the house all night or you're just going to be falling over yourself. Okay, so th that's basically what they used to do. And in synagogues also, we forget about this, so that by the time Shabbos was coming to an end, it was still light in the synagogue. You had to make sure to put 24-hour candles there. That was a big deal. Uh, so, uh, and also the, but when electricity was still expensive, I think Rav Schechter mentions this, people used to sit in the dark or they'd get you know, candles. We've had blackouts here over Shabbos. You know, this, the, for some reason, the infrastructure here isn't like, let's say, a, a major American city. Never had a, until until the great power outage of uh, Tuba Av back in 2003. I never had a power outage in New York. You know, you guys know about the power outage in 2003, right? You read about it 19 years ago. Wow, you people are young. Okay, 
uh, Tuba of 2003. It was a Thursday afternoon. I think it was a Thursday afternoon. I know because my friend got married. We were, I was driving. I was a designated driver, driving a few friends to the wedding. We got off the, the highway, the Long Island Expressway, and then on Jericho Turnpike, no traffic lights. I told my friends, this is crazy. Turn on the radio. Major power outage across the, the American Northeast. And me and the other guy were like, well, we we're shocked. We we're just like, oh, my God, a terror attack. Like, they're taking out the power. This is two years after 9-11. Oh, yeah. That's the first. In, and the other guy in the backseat was like, wow, what's so bad? Just the power outage. We said, don't you realize we've never had power outage in New York? Never, even even in winter storms, never had such a thing. I was born in '82, so this is now now it's like 2003, and suddenly there's no power. 2002. Yeah. Okay, fine, but that's we weren't born then, and this was a major deal. So this wedding went through. Thank God they had a generator there. The bride was very late to her own wedding. It was no no air conditioning. It was incredibly hot and humid. So that's what happened. Then you don't have these things. And then it was what it was like to go through Shabbos and be in New York. Like, you know, gas stations don't work. Luckily, the car had gas, so I was able to get back to where I had to go. But it was just, it was, it was crazy. Uh, this concludes the Nalachot of Beta Bechira. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Israel or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.